Okay. Hi. Ähm, herzlich willkommen zu unserem Bob Talk, äh, Input und Diskussion. Das ist unser erster Bob Talk. Um, and I will now speak in English because our guest is uh, here uh, live from London. Um, it is Kiran Pereira, and she's the founder and chief storyteller of Sand Stories. Um, she was born and raised in India and then came to London to uh, pursue her master degree in geography and also afterwards continuing her research on the topic of sand. And yeah, we're very happy to welcome you here uh, at the University of Stuttgart. Um, and yes, so we got to start uh, this whole Bob talk with an input from you. And afterwards, we will ask you some questions and we have like a dialogue on the topic of sand um, and also include the student question here. So uh, for the, in the YouTube chat, if you're watching over YouTube, you can add your questions there. Um, and for the people in the meeting, um, we will later bring you also into the discussion. Um, but please note that you're going to be recorded. So, um, yeah, I think we hand it over to you, uh, Kiran. I'm going to start uh, sharing the presentation. Super. Okay. So I hope you can all see the presentation now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Wonderful. So uh, before I start, I, I really, really want to say a big thank you for, for having me. It's such a, a pleasure to be here and I'm really, really looking forward to talking to you all and answering your questions to the best of my knowledge. Um, I have, uh, I'm down with a bit of a cold and a cough today, so please pardon me if I uh, suddenly uh, cough in your ears if you're wearing headphones. I'm really, really sorry. I try my best not to. Um, so. Um, so we're here today to discuss the, the urgent need to, to talk about how we manage our sand resources, right? Next, please. Super. Um, last year, um, many of you may be familiar with this already. Um, uh, so scientists published this article that said the global human man-made mass exceeds all living biomass. And that is a matter of concern because uh, we're talking about things like concrete and cement and bricks and like human made stuff that is more than all um, nature has evolved for billions of years and our stuff seems to exceed it. Next, please. Um, so why uh, are we talking about sand and why does it matter? It matters because um, in 2019, the UNEP presented a report on sand and sustainability. And in the report, they highlight this topic um, as a really, really big one. They say the scale of the challenge is one of the major sustainability challenges of the 21st century. And during my co uh, the course of my research, um, there was a common theme running through, and it was surprise. I was surprised really, really surprised at the number of things that sand goes into and the people that I was I was speaking to and interviewing and, and going to see, see and meet, they were as surprised uh, to know the other number of industries that were also dependent on sand. Now, uh, what complicates the matter is that sand is a non-renewable resource in human time scales. It does get renewed in nature, but we're talking geological time scales. So hundreds and thousands of years, sometimes even millions of years, right? Um, so when it comes to policymakers and how they, uh, this seems to have fallen in our blind spot, we talk about water, but we don't talk about what holds that water, which is the sediment, right? That's how I got into this topic because I was so interested in, I was interested in water. Water was a topic that's very dear to my heart. I remember as a child, waking up at three in the morning and going to help my family fetch water from a public tank because we did not have uh, our taps were running dry in the, in, in the house. Um, it was a very formative experience for me at that point in time. I thought this was normal. I did not think too much about it. And then of course, as, as I grew up, we moved houses and life became more normal, right? Quote unquote, you don't think about it. 
But at the point when I was trying, when I was thinking about doing a master's course, I kept coming back to, I saw hundreds and hundreds of trucks um, uh, along the city of Bangalore filled with sand going to construction sites. And I knew that all the sand was coming from uh, precious river beds and you know streams and that they were being decimated because of our demand for sand. I also knew, uh, having grown, grown up in, the, in this city in the south of Bangalore, in south of India, that uh, sand formed a very essential component of concrete. I just didn't know how much back then, but I knew it was necessary, right? I knew it was absolutely essential. So uh, this juxtaposition between it being so important for the environment and also being so important for development, as we knew, as we call it, um, it really got my caught my attention, and I wanted to study further. So that brought me to London ten years ago now to study this particular topic. Uh, and what I have discovered is that the top users are construction, land reclamation, industry, and the energy sector. Technically speaking, in official sources. They just talk about construction sand and industrial sand, but I have specifically teased out the energy sector because I think a lot of uh, the energy sector receives the lion's share of uh, attention and policies are made around that. So it's very important to kind of pay attention uh, to that. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, what I found out. Uh, so not it's important to mention that not not all sand is equal. There are very specific kinds of sand that are required for very specific uh, uses. Next, please. So uh, why this matters even more right now is because in the 20th century, it, we saw a 23 fold increase in natural resources used for building. So if you look at the trajectory that we are on, clearly this is not sustainable. And given the fact that sand is a non-renewable resource in human time scales, that compounds the problem, right? Um, so you can see that when uh, scientists did a study of the continental shelf in Belgium, and uh, this research is done by the natural um, sciences, uh, the Royal Institute of Belgian Nat Natural Sciences, Dr. Vera van Lanke. Um, so you can see that they mapped out the entire continental shelf. So even though sand is present, you can see that there are many competing uses. There's shipping, there are uh, you know, pipelines, there's uh, uh, wind farms. So that sand may not be available for extraction, even if it, is, it hasn't run out in the physical sense, right? Lots of competing uses. So therefore, the amount of sand that we have available to us is really, really limited and needs to be managed extremely carefully. Um, and so that's the point I want to drive home. Next, please. I don't expect you to be able to read uh, this. I know the text is like <laughs> really tiny, it's, but it's from, it's from the book, uh, where I highlight how uh, this particular, because of the scale and the pace of extraction, this particular uh, topic intersects with every single one of the, of the sustainable development goals. Um, and we'll talk more about some of them in, in the next few slides. Next. So here you see mining affected, a few mining effect, uh, affected communities, right? From, from uh, South Asia, South Asia. So uh, women tend to be impacted more because, uh, you know, because of, uh, yeah, it's just the way like, you know, when you talk about poverty and women, they tend to do, they tend to be impacted a, a lot more. Um, but at the same time, this is, even the men are, uh, there have been murders, there have been, and if you think about it for sand, you know, people are getting killed for sand. It's just fact sometimes is stranger than fiction. And it's not just the sand mafia that we need to talk about. We also need to talk about that this is a livelihood issue, right? For a lot of people, artisanal who are involved in artisanal sand mining, they're not, they are not the people who profit from it or make big money, but they are, but it is a livelihood issue for them as well. So when we address this problem, we need to look at um, uh, ensuring that there is also justice done to them as well. Um, next, please. And 
and uh, it's it's not just how how do we find ourselves in such a situation so in the uk for example in northern ireland this particular water body it has all the right labels it is a ramsar site it's the european special protection area it's a you know site of special scientific interest so technically this is a protected site but extraction still happens there and this is legal extraction right so it won't make news for illegal extraction um it has been fought in courts for for a really long time but the point is that this particular activity started in a time and a context where an environmental impact assessment was really not required and so um and it has continued to this day right and so we need to look at the kind of systems that are in place um and whether they're really serving us and serving uh, future generations because if you look at uh, the uk for example if architects want suppose a developer has let's say uh, you know a budget big 20 million to build to build something right um if if this developer wants to demolish the building and build a new the value added tax that he is charged is 0 per, 0 to 5% right but if they want to conserve the building and retrofit the building make changes to make it more energy energy efficient he has to pay a value added tax of vat of 20% it just makes no sense right so uh, this kind of distorted vat vat policy kind of incentivizes the wrong thing is not compatible with the climate crisis the biodiversity crisis it's something we need to look at Okay next please So you find extraction happening all over the world in tourist places Morocco beaches are being disrupted and uh, mined in order to build facilities for the tourists but the tourists are going there for the beaches so it's it's a uh, it's a complicated situation next please Um this particular these pictures from Indonesia where land reclamation has been planned uh, really fancy developments where you know uh, there will be lots of jobs but these jobs come at the expense of people who are already working um, as fishermen because they are you see here in on the left people who are trying to stop a dredger they're trying to confront the massive boat right uh, on the right you see these 20000 fishermen who sell their catch in the market and so land of reclamation can be really really problematic uh, because it disrupts the seabed uh, and disrupts the habitat of the fish so that impacts livelihoods it impacts the ecosystem it impacts biodiversity a lot of things right next please like i said a lot of we need to really question the systems we have in place Uh, a lot of us go to holiday destinations but we may not know that the sand that is being replenished there may uh, where is it coming from it may be coming from uh, places like western sahara from occupied territories so um, there's there there's, there's there are huge stories to be told here and we really need to look into it next please let's go to drink a glass of water Right. So here is um, mineral sand mining. It's not just sand that is used for beaches or land reclamation or concrete. We also, especially because you are architects, uh, I think you need to know that the we also extract minerals um, that go into paints, uh, paints uh, uh, for buildings, paints for automobiles, just paints in general, right? So for and this. comes from heavy mineral sands more often than not uh, because it's easier to get get it from heavy mineral sands rather than from rock um but it it can come from contexts that are hugely hugely problematic in this particular mine in madagascar for example 80% is owned by the mining company 20% is owned by the government so there's this huge power imbalance right um and so you find like the the white picture you can see of the the map kind of thing where the mining company actually encroached they broke national law they violated the buffer the zone that was meant to protect the people uh 
and uh, a charity, a British charity, says that they have been uh, the, the what they they got the water tested in the. Oof, I'm running out of breath. They got the water tested um, in the in the lake, and they found that the concentrations of uranium and lead was 50 times higher than what the WHO permitted. That's pro problematic because lead impairs uh, children's development. Uh, uranium is obviously a health hazard, right? If you, if you find concentrations of uranium in the water that you're fishing and using. So um, in order to green the mine, they said, OK, we will conserve, car do carbon offsets with this particular area. So we won't mine there or we protect the area there. But the people who are dependent on that particular forest area were not consulted. So they lost access to food. They lost access to firewood. They lost access to places where they could grow their food. They were pushed into infertile areas. It's hugely problematic, right? Um, so over a thousand, yeah, over 1,000 people uh, came together to file a class action suit in in a human rights court in, in the UK. But that was, uh, the company kind of paid off 50% of them. And so there were not enough people to come together and take action in court then. So these these kind of situations are hugely, hugely problematic. Um, so we need to look at the provenance of the materials that we use. Next, please. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite conscious that it, this is a really heavy topic. Um, it can leave people feeling like, oh my God, you know, it's, at least it suddenly left me at the end of my uh, master's. I was, I was, I was depressed. I was, I was so sad and disheartened by the, at the kind of world we were building. Um, and at that point I thought, okay, I'm just going to, I couldn't shake myself off this feeling, you know? So I said, okay, I'm just going to write a blog about it and then see where life takes me and get on with life. I wrote this blog and that blog got picked up by this director who was making this movie called Sand Wars, uh, Dennis Delistrack. And I've never looked back ever since, you know. So it's been 10 years now that I've been on this topic. And I'm constantly aware that this is a serious topic, but it doesn't need to be doom and gloom. It, it, these are choices that we make and we have the power to change, right? So one of the people I interviewed for the book, for example, I was really inspired by this. He said the Stone Age didn't end because there were no stones. <laughs> and that's that's so powerful. It really, really makes sense. Um, and there's another book called From What Is to What If by this author, Rob Hopkins, who's the founder, co-founder of the transition movement. And he really talks about how, the power of imagination and how it's really, really needed now. And this is what we are missing. We have all the technology in the world. We have, you know, everything, but we are missing the power of imagination. And that's what if we imagine a different world? What if, you know, is there a way to do things differently? So I'd like to take you through a few examples and then we can talk more. Next, please. Of course, being architecture students, you would be familiar with rammed earth construction. So you'll find solutions happening um, in every part of the world, right? Whether it's Africa, India, um, like in Europe, like all different things. Next, please. Here, this is an example of an individual practice that's working with local building materials. On the right, you see the uh, sketch of a, of a community college that they want to build. Again, with like local natural materials, no cement and um, concrete. So next, please. Um, also, what we need to, uh, what would really, really serve us well at this point in, 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 in time is moving to regenerative materials, materials that in our lifetime can be regenerated, can be reused. This is in a context where uh, every year a lot of paddy and wheat uh, straw is burnt because farmers have, uh, they find it very expensive to get rid of it, um, so they just burn it. And that has huge, it causes this huge smog problem with smog all across uh, North India and stuff. And so uh, this particular uh, CEO, she, she actually had a job in the, in the United States and she gave that up to come and work. She has a civil engineering background. And now so her company 
kind of manufactures the straw panels uh, with which they built COVID hospitals, COVID care facilities in remote regions of India. Um, so you can see what the healthcare sector is usually very, very particular about the kind of uh, the quality that goes into it. Um, and so they have no problem. They're, they were really happy. The hospitals were set up in less in shorter time. So it was a win win overall. Next, please. In uh, this particular example is from a, it, it was actually a German architect who spent some time in the, this village in um, Bangladesh. And she based this particular school building on the kind of architecture that she was seeing around her, the vernacular architecture, uh, just with a little bit more uh, scientific knowledge. So putting, giving a good base to protect it from the water and a good hat to protect it again from the, from the rain and stuff like that, right? Because this particular region does see mo monsoons, no cement used. Um, you can see the, the kind, and the villagers themselves helped to build the building. So uh, it's, a, it's a completely different feeling, right? Look at the kind of quality. Um, and this particular building has seen over 20 monsoons. So it's really, really inspiring. Next, please. You see also movements in uh, Greater Paris, for example, where people are trying to use raw earth, uh, specifically because it can be reused at the end of life. Next, please. Uh, you see waste-based bricks, for example, being used. You would never guess, right, that these bricks that have, uh, uh, the one on the left is from Manhattan, and the, uh, the one on the right is uh, uh, drive-through driveway in uh, Europe. So these bricks come from actually construction debris, but you would never guess. They look really top notch. They've been used in all high end stores. It's really, really beautiful. Next, please. And of course, these the examples that I gave you so far are of individual practices doing things, right? But what if it's possible to scale this up? What if we, an entire city adopted a kind of a mindset, a different mindset? So the city of Amsterdam, for example, has publicly, um, the whole of Netherlands actually, has um, aim, aims to have the use of resources, natural materials by 2030, and they want to become fully circular by 2050. That is the kind of ambition we need. That's the kind of ambition we need to see across the world. And it's really, really possible. Human creativity is phenomenal, I think. Next, please. So France has passed, uh, this is the last slide, I think. France has passed new legislation starting 2022. Uh, they're going to have all new public buildings to be built from at least 50% natural material. Um, timber, straw, geo-based material. Um, but the idea is to, so the, it came from, from because, because of the Summer Olympics that are going to be held in Paris, uh, where they are aiming to build timber buildings, which are eight stories high. They, you know, France decided, like the Minister for Housing said, if it's possible for the Olympics, it should be possible for normal buildings. And so it's really uh, exciting to see where this goes. Of course, the danger in such a thing is that uh, pressure will increase on this particular, one particular resource. So it's really important to widen your palette, um, to not depend all be dependent on one resource, if that makes sense. So yeah, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Oh yeah, for the resources, if you want to contact us, uh, that, that's where you can reach me. And if you want to read some more, watch the movie, that's what you can do. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. much. <laughs> Um, okay, so maybe as you know, um, we right now have like a project semester uh, or like a motto, a big motto of our whole semester called Bob, Bauen ohne Beton, Building Without Concrete. And a lot of evening um, lectures, but also uh, seminars and studios, they, they, they um, circle around this topic. And for us, the Building Without Concrete is um, more than just a material question. So first of all, it's, um, it's of course, concrete is like this big mission for CO2 gases and then the resources and also building with concrete equals like a one-way architecture, not in a full circle. 
where we can't uh, recycle the energy we put in, but also we don't often recycle the materials of it. And also building without concrete is furthermore like um, not building and um, so like reusing already existing structures. So what we want to do is we have three questions regarding first uh, this building without concrete. Um, and so like the first one would be, what are your thoughts on concrete? <laughs> I think concrete is a really useful material. It has been very useful in the past to lift people out of poverty and we must acknowledge that. Um, I think the problem arises with the scale and the pace at which we're using it. Um, so I think it's uh, it like plastic, right? Plastic is also incredibly useful, um, except that we have now used it for <laughs> just the scale and the pace at which we use it is problematic because then it doesn't degrade. Um, so, uh, so concrete, I think, is useful, but it needs to be res uh, reserved for applications where there's absolutely no alternatives. Um, in, in those contexts, so it would be wrong and irresponsible of me to say concrete is terrible, don't use concrete. No, I think it depends on the context. It really, really depends on the on the situation. Um, so concrete is very useful, but if it's coming at the at the expense of people and the environment, maybe we want to look, take a look at, you know, if we can do things different. Does yes. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Um, okay, so the, the second question is, um, how do you live? Do you live in a concrete house? <laughs> <laughs> yes, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I would love to live in a straw bale house. I'm such a big fan. I've heard so much um, and, and I've seen some really, really cool projects. Um, yeah. Okay. At, at the moment, we rent a house in London uh, and you don't get much choice. <laughs> so you just go where you where you can. Basically. Yeah. Okay, and then the third question would be, um, what are your thoughts on our semester motto, building without concrete? I love it. <laughs> I really, really love it because um, I think one of the biggest impediments, uh, barriers to imagining a different way of building is that so many of our professionals are trained on outmoded models of development, right? I, I don't think many people many architects or engineers or even finance professionals for that matter are getting trained on uh, or, or being exposed to environmental problems. And so today we are in this situation because uh, there's a disconnect between all the major costs are externalized, right? So you don't see it on the balance sheet. You don't see it. So when you make decisions, you're making them blindly. Uh, and so uh, I, I really, really appreciate uh, your, your faculty's decision to 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 expose students to these these kind of topics thumbs up <laughs> okay um <laughs> we quickly gonna add the other discussion um students um let me see how i do it maybe meanwhile i can uh, run with another question uh with respect to your um methods in your research of your master thesis I think at some point um, in the interview with Jan Böhmermann, you mentioned the uh, word um, or you mentioned that the sand business is a shadow business and or shadow economy and it is not yet well researched. Um, so I was wondering how you um, achieve to actually um, um, retrieve your information and verify them and bring them up for uh the scientific um yeah on the scientific level that's a very good question so at the point when i was doing my master's dissertation i really really struggled there was no scientific literature very little of it available in physical geography whereas i was coming at it from the human geography perspective um <clears throat> all i had was gray literature so it was really really difficult to uh put this in in academic academic literature right um 10 years on, I think we are in a far stronger place. There's a lot more uh, academic work and there's like a huge spate of articles coming out. I know lots of eminent scientists are working on this particular topic, so it's not going to be a problem for researchers going forward. Uh, so for me, part of uh, the little that I learned, the more I learned, the more alarmed I became, right? I was like, 
why isn't everyone anyone talking about this you know surely this is important and if if this is the kind of scale that we are talking about I, if for me it was just I, i i found it hard to wrap my head around it so the objective of starting the website was basically to just share what i was finding <clears throat> and it so happened that that website now serves as a point of contact so a lot of people contact me to say this is what is happening in our place can you do something about it so i wish i could help every person who came to me but I, what i would like to do is to kind of empower people share knowledge and help them do what what's needed to be done at their point right at location because i cannot be in every place and every at every time but what i can do is share information that i have learned that i think will empower communities that are, that will that will empower um professionals to choose better to choose differently if there's a possibility to do that um so yeah for me i it was a mix of it was a, a really long time and wherever possible i visited like uh, when i talk about uh recycling <clears throat> of concrete and stuff like that i i went to the to the quarry to to, to the place of recycling and i saw uh, i found it really hard to tell the difference between natural sand and you know sand that was actually and i also saw the raw material that was coming out it was just construction debris it was a really like a mismatch very very diverse kind of material that was going in this metal octopus kind of a thing it was being crushed up and uh gravity fed to a gravity separation chamber then washed straight to, and then at the end of all these uh arms there was a neatly segregated pile of different sizes of you know gravel and sand and uh, so, sort of thing so wherever possible i definitely cross checked triple checked all the information that i was sharing so yeah and um does it occur that um you also talk to policy makers i mean do <clears throat> policy makers actually approach you or is it rather that you approach them i think it's both um it's a uh, I, i think i may it, it, this is a topic that's growing in importance right now and the united nations and environment program great geneva is doing phenomenal work on it um they're kind of trying to bring together a lot of people trying to get more attention from policy makers and stuff like that um and i'm grateful to be involved when i can and stuff so it's really it's a bit of both uh sometimes i go and talk to uh top architects who i think you know should know about this topic uh, or i send out my book to say hey i think you'd be interested in this um yeah so thank you yeah um so <laughs> we want to first like put a discussion more on the focus of europe and german so more the local sand use mm. and so uh, do you have any informations about like germany or what is is it is it a problem here in germany actually like <laughs> it depends on who you ask <laughs> it really depends on who you ask if you ask people in the in the aggregate industry they will tell you there's no problem we are a very organized prop sector and um, i think uh, and, and that is true they it's 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 a fairly organized economy even here in the uk for example but what what i would urge you to research more is is the fact that this particular resource because i said it's non renewable uh, when you find it in nature it's not inactive it has a role it's playing a role there right it's it's a it's critical habitat for biodiversity it is it allows groundwater to percolate in the lean season it allows the water to come back again um it it is a important buffer for uh, extreme events and the kind of systems that we have set up in our world is there there are like more than 850000 dams that are blocking the flow of sand to the coasts um so you've and with sea level rise you know it's a problem the, the kind of systems that we have set up are really problematic also what i as i write in the book i think from 19 uh, i can't remember the exact date maybe 1950 something we in in the in the uk they have extracted uh, we have extracted about over 500 million tons of sand so because this is 
it, that kind of volume is not being regenerated, right? We are talking about material that would have been habitat otherwise that is gone. So we need to look at cumulative impact. That's very, very important. Um, I think, and that's not being, that's not coming through in discussions today. People will tell you, oh, we just mine 1% of the seabed, it's not a problem. Oh, we just do this 1%. But you need to look at cumulative because this is a non-renewable resource. So it adds up. And the pressure and impact on wildlife adds up. Yeah, I think uh, like a professor of a university made one time this picture of the use of concrete. And it's like, um, I hope I don't get the numbers wrong, but it's like uh, a wall that's around the earth that's 30 centimeters thick and one kilometer high that's being built every year with, with concrete. And like concrete is two thirds uh, sand or uh, half, <laughs> half, half sand. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible, these numbers. I think we can't really imagine them. Exactly. That's, that's the thing. When we talk about, and uh, even 50 billion tons is a conservative estimate. It's an estimate based on proxies because we, because countries aren't really tracking the amount of sand that is being extracted. So we use the proxy of how much cement is being produced. We know the kind of ratio of how much cement is needed to produce some concrete. And that's how we calculate roughly how much sand is being used, right? So it's not even the exact number. And it's so, given that this is a kind of conservative figure, it means it could be a lot worse than, so we really, really need to pay attention to this topic. And yet you find, like if you talk to a person on the street, off the street, nobody knows about this, right? Um, so it's really important to kind of raise awareness and uh, people still say, oh, but you can go to the Sahara. <laughs> no, you can't. It's a different, I mean, you know, so the conversation needs to change here. Of course, there are, there are people trying to now use desert sand and develop binders and stuff. But I think it's very important to, for the mindset to be right, because it, at, at one point in time, we thought that the oceans were so huge that we cannot possibly impact them, right? They're, as, as much waste as we want, we can take as much fish we want, it won't impact them. But we know for a fact that now we are having like incredible impact on the oceans and not in a good way. So even when we think about deserts, they're not empty places waiting to be put to good use. They are an ecosystem that has evolved over millions of years. And they have wildlife in there that have, that have evolved to really, really harsh conditions. And so there's something that we can learn from them. Um, so even if we find a way to use it, the ethos behind it is really important, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in Germany, how can we kind of change the situation that it's more profitable to also do urban mining, uh, recycle the concrete and not um, using uh, sand, fresh sand all the time, because we, we have the resource. Like, um, I think the numbers are, uh, so two thirds of the resource are being right now protected by uh, nature reservoirs and also they, they build up. Um, and one third of our total uh, sand uh, is, is able to be extracted. Um, but how can we change this to, that it's more prof or more, um, that, that the uh, recycling is more happening? I, I think uh, there isn't a silver bullet and it isn't going to be one person who can make the change. You know, it has to, we have to come at it from many different angles, from the top down, from the bottom up, wherever we can, however we can. Um, that's actually what will make the change, I think. Um, so asking questions, asking uncomfortable questions from producers, I think is important. Because today we live in a context where people care, right, about whether their food is coming from halfway across the world or whether it's grown locally. But today there's also a context where a German company was sh shipped sand to uh, Dubai in four days because the Suez Canal was blocked. And, uh, sorry, air freighted, like sent it by flight. If we are concerned about the about the carbon miles of bananas, just imagine a context where we're shipping sand, you know, there's such a heavy material. Um, so we really, really need to rethink how we use this material and can we find alternative ways of building it?
Yeah, like I, I think the the imagination of playing full of sand and like the material itself. Yeah, it's like nothing but the transport costs so much more, and also the emissions with it. Exactly, yeah. but we're yeah, not Jeff. tracking. We're not tracking that, so it, you it won't um, you won't find data on it, right? Because we're not tracking it. Hmm. So no data does not necessarily mean there's no problem. It could mean that we're not tracking it. That's yeah. important to pay attention to. Yeah. Um, so um, we have an audience question uh, regarding um, Europe, I guess, or the urban planning. Um, I just read it out loud. Um, do you think that the extreme urban densification <coughs> we're facing today is com Compatible with building without sand slash concrete? Mm. This is a really difficult question, um, but I think you're beginning to see solutions like timber, uh, lots of high rise buildings being built with timber. Um, again, uh, this is this is challenging given given the fact that if the if the pressure on forest resources are, are growing and we're growing monocultures, then communities are affected. So it really calls for a careful consideration of, I think what, what we need to take a stand against for sure is building these iconic structures as, as a statement, you know? I, I, I think we can, that's an era whose time has long gone. We can all acknowledge that we have fantastic skills um, you know, we don't need to build these showy pieces in order to, to get recognition. I think true recognition has to come from the fact that even demolition, trying as far as possible to kind of retrofit buildings, especially in the developed world, in, in mature economies, is really, really, really important. Uh, mm -hmm. Pulling down buildings in order to build a new, I think, is incredibly wasteful um, and ill-advised. Yeah. Um, is there another? Um, yeah, I think there's a question from Vera. You can turn on your mic and your uh, video too. Yep. Can you see <laughs> me? Yes. It's a bit dark. And so, uh, first of all, thanks very much for this wonderful presentation. It was really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, now we really understand the problem. Not that we not knew it before, but you really. Uh, pictured it very well. So now we kind of fear, um, yeah, the future and so on. So I wanted to ask you, where would you see the responsibility now? Would you say it's the architects and the engineers and constructors, <laughs> or is it more like politicians? <laughs> because I would say obvious also an economic problem. Yeah. Um, but both of these sides kind of um, tend to make economic decisions. So I wanted to ask, according to you, what would be the next step now, and who should take it? Okay. <laughs> so thanks, Vera. That's a thanks for for your kind words, and um, I think it's a really important question that you're asking. I've addressed it in the book, uh, and I say this is the chicken or egg story. You know, what comes first? <laughs> Uh, we'll never get the right answer. I think what really matters is what kind of world we want to leave behind and where does the buck stop? Uh, you know, um, <clears throat> I cannot control what other people do, but I can control what's in my jurisdiction, what I can do with my ability. And you never know how far your influence will go. Ten years ago, if you had told me that I would be invited to talk about sand, I would have laughed at you. Honestly, you know, it. It would, it's, you never know how, like, where life leads you and where um, a tiny stone or a tiny spark that you light, where the kind of uh, ripple effects it can create. So the tiniest of action can have a tremendous amount of uh, significance, importance in the time that we live in. So it's really important to take action wherever we find ourselves. Um, of course, it's important to also know that there is action happening at the, the UNEP uh, recently on October 12th, they convened uh, an expert roundtable on sand. So lots of different stakeholders came, people from the aggregates industry, people from the <clears throat> from uh, uh, NGOs and you know many different stakeholders were involved. Um, and this particular report is going is being synthesized. This conversation is being synthesized into a report that will be published next year. 
and it will be presented at the United Nations Environment Assembly. So this is a, the highest uh, body of environmental decision making in the world. It basically uh, has all 193 member states are part of it. So all the environmental min ministers of the world are part of it, right? Um, and so this particular topic will be presented to them next year. And so there is change happening when, for example, in 2019, when the UNEP report came out, it, it was quite influential in uh, two resolutions in UNEA. So that was one for sustainable infrastructure and the other one for mineral governance. So there is action happening at the policy level, except it's just that these kind of things really take a long time I, uh, you know, for to get get through all policymakers, um, and in the meantime, I think there's tremendous amount of change that can happen if we all act where we are. If, if you know, however we can. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think we can now like we already started to move out more in the global space, but maybe we can talk now more about uh, the global. Um, uh, sand uh, trade and uh, expanses of the sand. So, um, for example, I I work in an office where we have a lot of international um, um, buildings also. And how can we ensure um, by ourselves that uh, the sand we are using or the building uh, the building materials like we can also talk about steel or something else are. Um, ethical correct sourced. Um, can we do this? Is it possible or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, at the moment, I, I would say that you'd find it really difficult to find that information because it isn't being, it's not on the radar of uh, producers. Uh, everybody's talking about uh, carbon savings, <clears throat> technically, uh, but uh, responsible sourcing of sand, I don't think is yet on people's radar. So even asking the producers these questions will make people sit up and realize, oh, this is important. Maybe I should publish something about this or maybe I should pay attention, right? Um, so yeah, even just asking, talking about it, I think is really, really critical. Yeah. Yeah. So because I had a discussion uh, a bit later um, or like a few few months ago, um, with a guy mm -hmm. in New York who also um, works uh, on building ethics and so on. And they tried to um, search for where all their building materials are coming from, from one building, but they it, it goes from one trade to, uh, from one um, trader, tra no, is it trader, trader mm -hmm. to another trader, to another trader, so that you totally lose track of it. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, it's such a convoluted system of, that we have set up on globals, even glass, right? We talk about like the uh, glass behind you, for example, this pane of glass is 70% silica sand. Where did that come from, right? Uh, where was it produced? Where were these? Th so it's all manufactured in little bits and bobs and then assembled somewhere else. So it's such a complex system of manufacturing that we have today in today's world. And I think it's really important to um, <clears throat> ensure sustainability in and, and this word sustainability, it can mean anything. It's so open-ended, people can use it to mean whatever they want it to mean. So it's important to clarify, do they mean business as usual, continuing forever, like sustaining itself? Like what, how do they define sustainability? It's important to ask that question. Yeah. Um, so how exactly do the sand mafias work? Um, like because the sand, for example, I've heard in Morocco, Morocco, um, you, they don't, um, it, it's forbidden to, to, to actually use the sand, but the, the sand still ends up in the buildings at the end. And um, so how, how does this work? Can you explain it? <laughs> I think it works like any other mafia where people are paid off and they kind of infiltrate the systems of, uh, Mm, they don't seek to exercise power directly. I, I read this from some, uh, I can't remember the scientist's name, but they said they don't seek to exercise power directly, but they infiltrate and corrupt the systems that are meant to protect and serve people uh, and, and ecosystems. So <clears throat> when ev everybody turns a blind eye, everybody looks the other way, it's very easy to, to do stuff like this, right? Um, so there has to be, when people start speaking up, um, 
more and more people start speaking up, it'll be really difficult for something like that to carry on business as usual. Um, and why is there such a, why, why um, is it possible to have such big mafias on this topic? Like, is there not enough resource where you can get the sand from like official um, mining and so on? Or is it too expensive or what are the causes that the sand mafia is so um, uh, rentable? <clears throat> I think it depends on the situation of uh, each each location. Um, in some places, uh, it, this this particular topic falls in our blind spot, right? Nobody talks about sand in their daily life unless they are planning a holiday by the beach. That's the only time we talk about sand. Uh, otherwise, it's, it really goes unnoticed. At the same time, this this is not the this is not a controversial product. It's not like drugs and it's not like arms and ammunition and stuff like that. So it's easy to get involved in this trade. You, unlike other uh, mineral resources where you need really specialist knowledge in order to um, uh, uh, to scope out the whether this resource is there, it takes five years between when the resource is located and when actually it gets produced in a usable form. That's not the case for sand, right? Your reserves are what you see around you. Um, and yes, you may be using the wrong type of sand to build, uh, where it's not washed out, uh, the, the sand has not been washed out and stuff like that, but it's still sand. It can You can still build it, build with it. So it's easily accessible. I think that kind of adds to the mix as well. So it's really a complicated image that uh, <clears throat> many people are now trying to tease apart and find out. How can you, so if the mafias are so um, involved into the policies and so much corruption is happening and so on, so how how can you change it? Where do you start? Um, does I, it need to come from people or? It's, it's both. It's a, I think it has to come from people. There's also technology can help, like the, uh, the government, um, the, what are they called? Uh, the body that, that kind of, uh, the Comptroller General, General of India, these, this is a, a body that kind of examines the work of the government to check if the government is doing its job, you know, like very, various de ministry departments are do, doing its job. They, they kind of found that um, they use technology to find, so they use drones to kind of uh, identify problems. And they found out that the um, mining department had authorized um, so the environmental permit had been given for a specific piece of land along a river. This is private land, but the mining had been approved for for mining in the riverbed. So it's two it, uh, two different coordinates, and you can see, and then they use drones to find out that uh, mining wasn't being wasn't actually permitted before I think six a.m. But they six or seven a.m but they found that mining was already happening at 5 a.m., you know? So in situations where it's really difficult, I think technology can help, but it would be naive to depend on, to say that technology will completely solve this problem. No, the, I think there has to be an element of um, like human involvement and care, and we have to look at the systems of governance, uh, look at bring in uh, monitoring, enforcement, and compliance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the world is still growing and the population is still growing and especially in the development countries they also want to reach a high standard of living and um like as you said concrete is is so important to fight um poverty and so on so what are your thoughts here um is the sand supply being manageable um without like destroying the total environment of uh, of things or how do you weight these things too? Yeah. yeah. So if we go by, I, I think there are already census estimate that we are already extracting twice or thrice more than uh, what ri the rivers of the world deliver. Um, so it may be a problem, um, but but the point is, I think when it comes to development, we don't have to repeat the same mistakes that that were made in the past, right? There's a way to leap forward to leapfrog it and to, to find different solutions. So if if buildings are being built, uh, maybe two stories and you know, not, we're not talking about high rise building, but wherever possible, 
and that's the majority of the buildings, right? We can look at using alternative, uh, alternative uh, ways. And especially when I talk about things like straw bale, we grow rice, we grow wheat every year, whether, you know, it's this, and this is a problem to get rid of. But if we are able to convert this into straw panels that can be, can be load bearing as well, it's a huge win-win for everybody involved. So really looking at how we can uh, utilize regenerative materials, materials that are vernacular to that particular place and time, I think will help. Yeah. Yeah, um, we have another audience question coming in. Um, as your research is so triggering um, and eventually for us architects changing the notion of concrete, um, the romanticized notion of concrete. Um, have you uh, run into problems with the sand industry while you investigated? Or <laughs> kind of resentments? <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> so, so let's just say I'm not this popular. <laughs> um, no, I think uh, people recognize that there are, there, that that the scale and pace of, of our extraction is problematic. Uh, you cannot deny that. If you if you want to see for see it for yourself, I mean, when I visited villages around Mumbai, it was disheartening. It really was. I, the whole uh, you know I visited a village of fishermen. They have been fishermen for generations. Uh, they know the river like the back of their hand. But their river was changing so rapidly that they could not fish anymore. In the past, like one boat used to support five people. Today, even if they fish for the whole day, they couldn't support even one person or two people. You know, it's the it's it's really really disheartening to see uh, the damage that's being infiltrated by being done by dredging. Um, and so, if you want to experience this for yourself then you should go to see where the sand is being extracted and the kind of impact it is having. Constant noise, 24 seven, uh, dust pollution, like water uh, is being, uh, systems being impaired and stuff. It can be triggering, yes. Uh, but just because, you know, it's uncomfortable, we cannot shy away from this, right? This is the largest volume of solid substance, like a, large, a solid material extracted on earth more than any other you can think of. And so we can ignore it. Can we? <laughs> Not really. We have to address it some way or the other. Right. So um, we have another question more from, I think, more again local or material-wise. Vera, if you want Vera, Vera maybe you can uh, say it again. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I can do that. Um, can you see me? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I was wondering, what do you think about, uh, things like recycling concrete and self healing concrete and all these new forms that more or less claim to be sustainable? Uh, could they maybe be a game changer or do you say that's just greenwashing because they still need sand and cement? Uh, so I, I think that there could be potential in that, but uh, we need the devil is in the details. We really need to. It depends on the context, and uh, people need to read the fine print. You know, if 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 you know what I mean, it's like look at, um, yeah. I, I, as long as we can ensure that we don't, um, at the end of life, just toss it into the landfill. I think that's a huge waste of resources. It's a, because it's coming at such a cost to the environment, to people, we really need to value it and ensure that it's being um, honored for the kind of value that it's, it's, it's added in our built environment. So it can, there can be solution potential there, but it really varies from context to context. Um. Yeah. So uh, this you were talking about the fishermen who lost kind of their um, base of living with the fish. And so um, some of them will start like going maybe to the sand mafia or going to the sand trade, but this will um, 
again destroy the living foundation for the fishermen and so on so it's a down circling spiral that absolutely is, how can we break that um where how, do you do you know any solutions there or is there any way to I, break something? i think it starts um it, it, like architects are well placed to design differently if possible you know wherever you have the power to uh educate your clients because I don't think clients know that this is a problem. Um, <clears throat> and so it's it's really, it has to start at the design stage um, because wondering what to do with the product after it is pulled down is a bit too late. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 at that stage, you have all sorts of additives that are not uh, conducive to a circular economy. So it has to start at the de design stage, right? Um, and so, yeah, so what's happening with the fishermen is that then many are pe many people, because they don't have any livelihood, they're moving to cities. And of course, cities are getting overcrowded. And then, you know, it's like, it really, as I said, is a vicious cycle. So if we can ensure uh, people are aware that the, uh, of the whole value chain, um, and there's a, there's a lot more transparency and a lot more questions being asked about where this product is coming from, what kind of impact it might be having? Can we do something to mitigate it? It can be, uh, you know, look, designed differently. I think it would. Okay, so last question, maybe. Um, <laughs> what can we do? So first of all, what can, for example, the German government really do? What can uh, the architects here in Germany do? And what can we students do right now to help this global crisis situation? I, I I think you are uh, the very fact that you've organized a talk like this is kudos to you. Uh, I haven't. This is the first I have come across of you know such a brave uh, decision to, to for architects to talk about the time to design without concrete. It's quite radical, I must say. So I congratulate you. Um, it's very inspiring. I'm sure you'll find many more schools joining you in this in this journey. And uh, don't get disheartened by the scale of the challenge. All you have to do is see what you can do within your power. What can you do today? You know, uh, because we do not have the ability to change the world. All we can change is our world. Mm -hmm. Work in the area of your influence. Stand in your power. That's where you will find that change can happen. And as your influence grows, you will be able to reach more and more people, right? Um, if we wait for change to happen outside there, I think that can be really problematic. So, <clears throat> so by all means, form a community, uh, get involved in activism, all of that, but do what is in your power to make a difference. And as architects, I think you're extremely well placed to have a tremendous influence on the future of this particular topic. That's very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. Okay, then I think we are at the end. Or is there any further question from the audience? Um, is there another one? No. 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 But uh, <laughs> I can hear or I can feel the audience tremendously applauding you for this bold <laughs> and inspiring um, pub talk we had with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. On behalf of um, the faculty, thank you for your time. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, do, would you like to um, add something to the final? Yeah, so just uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for this really, really exciting uh, and stimulating questions. I really appreciate it. And I'm very happy to uh, interact with you and yeah. yeah. Okay, so the for the next um, Bob talk will happen, I think in a month, I don't have the right date right now, but we will uh, share it over Instagram and we will have a person from Architects for Future here to talk about how to change the education uh, in architecture to a more sustainable way. Super. And we're looking forward to that. And also tomorrow there will be the Ring for um, again, uh, dedicated to the building without concrete topic. And afterwards, uh, there will be the November Reihe, um, but it will be just in uh, presence, like not online streaming. And yeah, so I wish you all a very nice evening.
And again, thank you a lot. Thank for you coming. so much, Karen. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>